This is the Serial at Midnight Podcast. Howdy gang, welcome to the Serial at Midnight Podcast. My name is Heath Holland. This week we're talking to Larry Block, a.k.a. Lawrence J. Block, the screenwriter of The Fun House, the amazing 1981 Toby Hooper horror movie, The Fun House. I love this movie. It's one of my favorite horror movies because it's got this, so it's a slasher movie, but it's also got this, uh, a little bit of a supernatural tone to it, set in a fun house. For some reason, I just love movies that are set inside of like carnival locations, especially, because carnivals are, are mysterious already. You know, they're sort of places that, they're, they're, they're like gypsy, you know, traveling gypsy shows. They roll into town. You don't know who these people are. They roll back out again. And and that's all in the fun house. There's, there's been other movies that kind of do, you know, after hours in the carnival. I'm thinking of a movie called Dark Ride from, uh, I don't know, probably 15 years ago. It was like one of those eight films to die for after Dark Horror Fest. But does anybody remember the mid-70s? Uh, it was a Disney movie called Whiz Kid and the Carnival Caper. I think that was the name of it. But does anybody else remember that? Uh, so maybe, you know, this has been in my... It's been rattling around in my brain for a long time. But none of them do it as much as... As well as The Fun House, which is such a... It's fun. It's creepy. It's got this Hitchcockian thing going on that just like the tension ratchets up. Having seen it so many times, it's still very tense for me. I love it. I love the fun house. It's a real pleasure for me to talk to Larry about the making of the movie behind the scenes stories. There's so much here, guys. This is really sort of a uh, a secret revealed kind of a thing because we're finding out all kinds of stuff in this episode. What was it like to work with Toby Hooper? You know, Toby Hooper uh, made a lot of movies that we like, but there was a dark side of Toby Hooper too that more and more people are talking about now that he's unfortunately no longer with us. Um, so, you know, I actually, I talked to Donald M. Morgan, the cinematographer of Christine. He worked with Toby Hooper on a project. He talked a little bit about that in that interview. And now we're getting more story from someone that collaborated with him much more closely, uh, creatively, which is Larry and Toby Hooper. Uh, but also here is the real, man, this is so interesting to me. Uh, so Larry got to visit the set of Poltergeist, and we've been debating for decades. Did Toby Hooper direct Poltergeist? Did Steven Spielberg direct Poltergeist? Here's information from somebody that was there on the set. What did he see? We find out in this episode. Uh, so many secrets revealed for the Fun House. Is is the book closed on the Fun House, or is there still a possibility for more chapters in this story? The, the, the answer may surprise you. So there's so much stuff here, guys. Please uh, share this video with, uh, or this podcast, because it's a video and podcast form, video and audio form. Please share this. This is a fascinating episode for anybody that loves horror, especially uh, how horror is made. This is, there's a lot to learn here in this episode. So guys, without further ado, Mr. Larry Block. You know, the thing with remakes is that the movie, the, the original movie, right? It takes place, it, it comes from circumstances. It comes from a specific time and a specific place and it's got a tone. And the thing that I love about Forbidden Planet is that it is so rooted in that Cold War paranoia thing, like watch the skies. And I don't know if they did remake it. I feel like it, do you see the Keanu Reeves version of- um, um, Yes. You know what I'm talking about. I it's know, not you're the talking same, about- right? Yeah, but but you know, it, 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 I love that this is the shorthand. People who love horror movies, we're having shorthand right now. It's very you know, yeah. in terms of yeah, uh, that that was uh, the day the earth stood still. Yes, right? yes, yeah. So I mean, it really depends on the movie. I I think Forbidden Planet is is just so universal. I mean, it's it's actually it's actually believe it or not structured like a like a Shakespeare comedy. Um, believe it or not, yeah. It's so um, universally, mo most really good horror movies are founded on principles of uh, th th they're, moral, they're morally correct. And those morals, they don't change. And whenever you see a movie that's a remake where they change the ending to make it something that's like present day, it absolutely screws it. Yeah. You, you, you. I mean, I, I've, I've seen this so many times when, when they did uh, the taking of Pelham one, two, three. It's a great movie. The original movie is a great movie. It's totally morally based. It's, it's a mystery. It's a thriller. It's a who done it, and the guy, the bad guy, gets caught at the end when the cop sneezes. Well, they change that ending to have him get away. 
So if you have them get away, it's no longer a morally based film and it no longer, uh, it, I don't think it resonates with audiences for the most part. So, mm-hmm. you know, I was thinking about the fun house and I was thinking about how it is essentially, it's like this timeless story. You know, it is a, it is a horror classic now at this point. And it feels, I don't know, like when I watch it, it feels like maybe it's got a foot in the universal monsters or even in the 50s stuff that we're talking about. And I was just wondering if that's something that's intentional from you, if that was like, if it's your influences coming through, where that comes well, from. Okay. My influences in, in, in movies is the, the same influences as every great director who's, you know, who's, who's operating today. You know, they all, they all watch the same movies that I watched. They all mm-hmm. fell in love with the Twilight Zone. Twilight Zone were, were great. They were short stories that were basically O. Henry stories. They had surprise endings that really kicked you right in the gut. And they were great, but they always had that surprise ending. So, you grow up on that, you know, I grew up on uh, the Seven Voyage of Sinbad. It absolutely freaked me out. It's a beautifully written story, by the way. The story is extraordinary. The way it dovetails into it and everything pays off. And it, I mean, plus the Ray Harryhausen effects and it, it, it's a really classic movie. And I think, you know, again, most directors have seen that and they were blown away when they saw it, if they saw it in the theaters or they, you know, or they projected it on a big screen. Uh, so they had those influences, but those are all totally morally based movies where you must have the villain get his due or her due at the end of the movie. So, and, and, and it also, it dealt with, you know, with, with, uh, they're very, in a sense, they're Shakespearean and everything that's Shakespearean is actually biblical, either, you know, like Old Testament about, you know, good versus evil and all the great classics basically have that theme built into them. So the fun house was really interesting. I loved horror movies. I grew up on the, on the, uh, the William Castle films. I, I you know, the, the, uh, uh, house on haunted Hill. Again, here's another example. The remake of, 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 of house on haunted Hill has nothing to do with the original movie. Right. And so when it came to fun house, I wanted to do some kind of a haunted house movie, believe it or not. And I struggled with it. I mean, we, we had just come out to Hollywood, my family, you know, my, my wife, we, we, we hadn't had kids yet. We had a German Shepherd dog we brought with us. And I really wanted to do a, a haunted house movie. And at that time, there were some popular things going on where you could, you could, you could, um, they had theater dinners where you went to a dinner like in a like in a house mm-hmm. and they they put on the little shenanigans that you saw in you know in, in murder mysteries and you had to guess it yeah. so at first i was thinking in terms of that and i was thinking in terms of uh you know it's all automated now and the automation goes wrong and so the whole thing screws up but then i got to thinking i remembered when i was like 17 years old 16 years old i was a, a cit at a camp in in, in upstate new york and they took us. They took us to the uh, to a county fair. Now back east, and this was the tri-state area. They, this county fair is, is not like what the county fairs you're having right now in like in Los Angeles. I don't know how it is where where, where you are, but this was raunchy. Yeah. This was sexy. This was this was you know this was like white trash. This was carnies operating, and this had an incredible fun house. Uh, and I tried, to, I remembered this, it had such an impact on me because there was a lot of still forbidden stuff. If you weren't 18, you couldn't go to the girly show. They actually had a girly show at this place, you know? And so I just remembered that. And then I thought to myself, the best haunted house in the world would be a haunted house on wheels, which moves from county to county. And wow, wouldn't it be something, you know, happened at something like that where kids came up with the idea and I think it's a universal idea. What would it be like to spend the night in the fun house? The same thing, spend the night in a museum. It's a crazy idea that gets into your head. So that was when I all of a sudden said, oh my gosh, make it a haunted house movie, make it in a fun house. Mm-hmm. I started doing research and the whole thing about the carnies is absolutely extraordinary. Uh, the, the shows that they had, you know, at, 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 at carnivals, traveling carnivals were unbelievable again raunchy, sexy, deviant, you know, animal freaks, uh, 
you know, crazy food, rides that, that, that would, you know, that would, were designed to sort of like make you really nauseous. And then, and then notoriously, these rides would break down. And I mean, I, I even had a scene, it was deleted, a lot, were a lot of deleted scenes, but I even had the, the, one of the carnies in the fun house uh, saying, the guy asked the guy with, a, with an, like a redneck ac accent, uh, you know, how come every time one of these rides goes bad and people are injured, the, the rides double? How come? How come? And the guy says back to him, ain't you ever heard of Sigmund Freud? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Meaning it, it's a death wish kind of a thing yeah. that people do that. I mean, I'm, yeah. I myself personally, when I used to ride the roller coasters, I would feel like I was going to die when it took the dip. And, yeah. you know, some people like it and some people don't like it. I used to force myself to do it, but I literally feel I'm going to die. Yeah. So that's where the Funhouse came out of. And I just reconstructed everything that I remembered about that county fair. Now, the, the other thing that was really interesting about it is, is that um, I had a structure to that. A lot of people complain that it, it's, a, it's a slow burn movie. But I wanted you to believe that you could have Gunther the monster. You could have a monster that was like troll-like with glowing eyes. I had conceived him as being much more hulking. And uh, it's, it's interesting, Tarantino picked up on this in his new book, uh, uh, Cinema uh, Speculations, picked up on it uh, like big time, where he said it in, 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 this, in the screenplay, apparently he got his hands on the screenplay, that Gunther was this, Hulk, and once the Frankenstein mask comes off, he was this hulking supernatural creature like a troll. And he could see he, he had night vision and he could smell you out, you know, from in the labyrinth of the of, of the fun house. Um, so I that's what I really wanted. So I wanted people to believe that you could have a what seems like a like a, like a slasher movie. You could have a bona fide monster in it. So I had a pattern set up that every every exhibition they went to became wackier and wackier and bordered on the supernatural so that there was an order to it It was like the rides are like fun it's all mechanical it's all like fun but then you know but then you go to the magician and you know the magician is fooling you by talking about the fact that all legends are rooted in something which is why i have uh, i have uh, uh, bill finley do that little speech about you know about the origins of the dracula uh you know belief in dracula because of vlad the impaler and then and then i have them go you know to the freak show and the freak show shows you, oh, gee, there are, there really are there really are you know uh, anomalies in nature they're freaks of nature and then, and then you, and then you actually see the the freak show where you realize, you know, you you, you have, and then, oh, and then you have Madame Zena, who basically it's a real supernatural experience that you have at the end of that session where the kids are laughing hysterically, but she's seeing something terrible about to happen to these kids. Yeah. So I had that pattern set up. Now, when they edited the movie, they switched it around a little bit, which made me crazy. I couldn't convince them that you had to go in it where it was getting darker and darker because even in the fun house, I had it where, where it goes from fun and games, they cut out a whole scene where they were just playing around with each other. They just didn't settle down right away and, 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 and try to have sex in the, in the, uh, in the fun house. Yeah. I mean, you know, the storytelling comes from the classic structure of uh, the, the Twilight Zones with the surprise endings and the big reveals and uh, and also immersed in horror movies. I, I grew up, you know, loving horror movies. And uh, by the way, most horror addicts, people who really love horror movies and know their horror movies, they were exposed to them when they were kids. And usually they had a parent involved. So it's a very weird thing, like that scary feeling you get is a very loving feeling. It's a very nurturing feeling because you also remember that your parents, one, tried to scare you, but then laughed. If they did scare you and say, it's okay, it's only pretend. My grandmother was a great storyteller and she, and she used to, uh, 
these are all cautionary tales to teach kids not to steal, to teach kids not to talk to strangers, to you know, to teach right. girls to maintain their virginity. Uh, these these are all cautionary tales about this. And my grandmother used to; she was a great storyteller. She was she she was born in America, you know. Uh, now it would have been a hundred years ago, and uh, but uh, you know, very proud to be an American. But she once told me a story, a kidnapping story. She said that she was in elementary school and they had they had um, a teacher basically got in front of the class and warned them there's a traveling carnival that's coming to that's coming to you know uh, to New York to Queens or whatever it was and uh, don't go to the carnival and don't talk to any of these people because there's a lot of gypsies there and they've been known to kidnap kids and she's and my grandmother said to me she had one friend and she named the friend who didn't listen to the parents and went to the carnival and they never saw her again. Now, to me, it's like, you know, it's a kid and you know, it's probably a, a, a grandma's tale, you know, but it, it's sort of like part of the nature. And so yeah. you have that, that thing about, and, and of course you have the thing about don't lie because lying will always get you into trouble. So, right. Let me ask you another question about the fun house. So did you intend when you wrote the three Barker roles, did you yeah. envision one actor portraying all three of those? Is that part no, of your idea? No, no. The, the, okay. the story behind that was, okay, I, I, I you know, I, I wrote the script. It was three different Barkers. Uh, and that was Kevin Conway who said, I'll, I'll, we were very lucky to get him. He had, he had played uh, a similar role on Broadway in uh, The Elephant Man. And uh, and he said, well, I'll do the movie, but I want to play all, all I want to play all three parts of the three Barkers. And I think it, it did it great because thema he had read the script and thematically it made sense because I was messing around with the whole concept of 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 anomalies. Like, you know, so it's triplets or something, you know, the same way I had the same way I had in the uh, in the formaldehyde jar, which I had seen at, at a county fair. There, there was a baby who was supposedly the brother of uh, Gunther, a little Tad, the brother. And, you know, I don't want you to wind up like your little brother Tad and, and, you know, and put on display like that. So, yeah, so that, 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 that went right along with it. As, as long as people are on board, mm -hmm. the creative, the, the, the most exciting thing in the world is if people are on board, the, cre the, the, the creativeness that comes out of a group coming up with ideas. I, I mean, I work with Mort Rabinowitz, who is the set designer, and, and with Andrew Laszlo, who is the, the DP. These are all award-winning people, amaz amazing people. You know, Laszlo, uh, Andrew Laszlo uh, did The Young Warriors. I'm sorry, The wa Warriors, the Walter Hill film, where they actually pulled it from theaters because of the, the gang violence that, that yeah. broke out. It's a gorgeous film. By the way, that film, is, you know, that's a retelling of the story of the Odyssey. It's like you're lost and you're going from you're going from place to place and you're meeting the sirens and you're meeting this. So, again, it's a totally morally based, historically based, structurally sound movie. It's a, it's a great movie. And we and we had uh, Andrew, we, we, we had more and we had more Rabin, Andrew Laszlo was the DP and we had more Rabinowitz. Who had who was the set designer who designed the sets for uh, they shoot horses don't they, which was one set, so we couldn't. I mean, and he did Castle Keep, which was basically one giant set, so it was a natural fit to you know to be able to get him to do the funhouse, you know, uh, to design the funhouse, and boy, he he just came through the you know blueprints and i have by the way i have copies of those blueprints uh he gave them to me we became very good friends but so he designed it but they were all very respectful they 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 all they all got the script the only thing that happened on that project that was disappointing is one of the producers uh and it was more of a, like a line producer like but a real producer never liked the movie never got this never understood what i was trying to do in the script and that that was problematic i mean it was really sad i mean i there were things that i did i, I worked it out very carefully i broke every scene down i have even in the beginning when we do the uh when we do the homage to uh to uh halloween and psycho um 
And that was interesting how that came about. But I, I had a thing where I had the mouse, the little the guy's got a mouse in his room, Joey. I had it running through a maze because that maze was exactly a miniature of the fun house. And, and, and people who didn't get it, you know, who didn't, some of the people didn't get it, just said, okay, so we'll have him going around on a wheel. He's going, no, it's not the same thing. Yeah. I wanted to decorate their house. I wanted to put a lot of bird paintings on the walls. On, on, on the house, because I wanted to duplicate a little bit of the psycho thing, which is all about birds on the walls. And so one of the producers, oh, I, I've, I, I've got, you know, I've got all these great pictures from my kid's room and it, it, we could do that. No, no, <laughs> I want it to be birds because I want it to be that way. You know, they also over, they overdid the kids, they overdid the kids room with the torture stuff. I, I, I wanted it to be a dark room. I wanted it there to be horror movies, the filled with horror movies, yeah. a giant Frankenstein poster, which they used. I had one of those in my room. Uh, and, uh, but uh, the, the, again, getting back to you, I think it was your original question about it, the whole new generation of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of filmmakers or executives who are making these decisions are uh, used to be a joke. Somebody who doesn't know movies and they become an executive, they don't love movies and they become an executive and you come in there and you, you pitch a story and the only thing they can say is, does it have to be, can it be this? So you say it's, it's for the kids and they go, you know, they, 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 does it have to be kids? You know, you know, yeah, you know, and, and the girl, does it have to be a girl? You know, and it, it's a guy it's a, and they sort of like don't understand, they really genuinely don't understand that there is a expected trope in good storytelling and in good horror movies where the male forces go after the girl who is the heroine this is going back to gothic you know literature for crying out loud and and being chased and then in the end overcomes the evil it, it, it's it's it, this again this is hansel and gretel this is this this this, this is uh, the three little pigs this is you know uh 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 any of this you know it's the big bad wolf tale. It's grim. This is what they're it fairy is. tales, oh, like, but yeah, they're yeah. Grimm's fairy tales, and Grimm's fairy tales are very dark. Yeah, I want to ask you about Toby Hooper because um, I love Toby Hooper. I love a lot of his movies. I don't love all of his. But I, I love a lot of his work, but I have you know he is a controversial figure in a lot of ways. Writers don't always get along with the director. Did you get along with Toby Hooper? I got along with I got along with him fine. Uh, the, but the reason why I got along with him fine is that. This wasn't something that he developed with me. There's a lot of misconceptions about this. This was a spec screenplay. So I met, I met Toby Hooper. I was pitching, uh, I was pitching a horror story. Again, pitching in, in, in the in the you know, 70s and 80s, everyone did pitch meetings. So I, I had meetings with uh, Levy Gardner, Laven Productions, with Arthur Gardner, who became a very dear friend of mine and a supporter of mine. They had done uh, the, the Rifleman, the series, and the Big Valley, the series. But they did one horror. They did one horror movie. They did a horror movie called the I think it's It Challenges the World. It was the, the, these eggs, you know, the, the eggs and the thing that hatches out of it, and they get it at the end with the fire extinguisher. So they had done that. It was a, a low budget. They also did all the uh, John Wayne, the later John Wayne movies. So, but these were great people. So I was in there uh, pitching, uh, about to pitch a story. I, I, I was waiting, you know, in the lobby to go in and pitch a story to them, um, which they actually put into development with me. But they said, listen, we're finishing up now. Toby Hoop is coming out. Why don't you guys say hello to each other? And, and Larry, I'll call you when we're ready for you. So I'm I'm in the lobby and Toby Hooper comes out and you know I you know I I wasn't an avid fan of of, of Chainsaw but I you know I uh, I was like it was kind of like amazing that you know, go, hey how you doing there yeah yeah how are you Larry uh, so uh, what you working on they, they all always what you work every director is always looking they what you working on okay well you know I got this thing called the Fun House. 
really? Yeah, it's about a it's about a traveling carnival, and a and a bunch of kids decide to spend the night, and then one by one, he goes, oh, this is great. I love this kind of stuff. I I love Nightmare Alley. I, I love this kind of stuff. When do you think it's going to be finished? And I said, I got a couple couple of weeks. He says, okay, well, do me a favor. Here's my number. Get it over to me when you're done. And I'll have a look. So. I'm like I'm kind of like amazed. You hear this a lot, but but you you know, and he definitely was a force to deal with. Uh, and so I I finished the script, and I I had in mind. Then I started watching, like really studying Texas Chainsaw Massacre, mm-hmm. because I because and then I realized that there were a lot of tweaks that I could do, that would kind of like match something like that. Uh, and we'd, and we'd, we'd make it better. So I, st- I started, you know, playing up the dysfunctional family even more and, uh, a bunch of other stuff. And I finished, I finished the script and I called him up. I figured, you know, I don't know, maybe he will look, maybe, maybe he won't. And he said, no, 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 send it over. Send, send the script over. I'll have a look. And so, you know, how long do you think it'll take you to read it? He goes, I'll, I'll read it over the weekend, which is unheard of. Like you wait like a month for people to read stuff. And uh, he calls me up and he goes, I really like this. I really, really like this. And I, I'd like to be able to option it. I like it so much. So I have a friend, he says, a producer friend, Mark Lester, who, was, who had gone on to direct, he directed Firestarter and, 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 and then he has a bunch of low budget movies that he developed and directed himself. But his biggest one was Firestarter. And I think I can get him to put up like, you know, let's say a thousand bucks. Would that do it for you to option it for like a period of three months? I go, yeah, sure. That, that sounds good to me. So he got Mark Lester to option the script for, for me. Mark Lester knew a guy, uh, D- Derek Power uh, had just gotten a job with Mace Newfeld as a development executive for Mace Newfeld. And so in the process of, it, first it was option, Mark Lester did the option, Toby held the option and teamed up with Derek Power. Derek Power started working for uh, Mace Newfeld, who had done the Omen movies and wound up doing all the uh, Harrison Ford movies as well, like all the big Harrison Ford thriller, thriller movies. And so when, when so he, Derek Power brought the script to Mace Newfeld, and at that point, horror had just kicked in big time, um, and uh, they and they wanted to cash in on the horror slasher business, mm-hmm. so they went to Universal Studios with it, and they took it to to uh, Tom Mount, and uh, Mount said they were going to make they they wanted to make the movie. And then there was even a bonus about it where they were going to do a book version of it, and et cetera. And it was like really, really super exciting. It was so exciting that uh, I had a, I had a my brother was getting married like a like like a couple of weeks after this thing kicked in. We were so my wife and I were so excited about it, you know because we had flown in, we had moved from New York to come out to Hollywood. We had been out in a year, and then all of a sudden we hit after a year, and it was like kind of extraordinary. So I remember going to the wedding and, oh, you got a movie made, you know, you, you know, I'm so excited about that. And then right before we go to the wedding, I get a call from Mace Newfeld saying the deal is off. Uh, uh, Tom Mount doesn't want to make the movie anymore. And then we, oh my gosh, we already told the whole family that we had a movie that was in the world. This is a terrible thing about being a freelance writer. And so we pretended that everything was fine. And then we came back to town and it turned out it was fine. They actually talked... Uh, they talked Tom out into uh, going ahead with the movie. They did it as a negative pickup. They did it for a budget of around three million dollars, um, and uh, we, you know, we went into development on it. It was really interesting. Uh, but working with Toby, he he was he's a Texas gentleman. He 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 was very friendly, very nice. Could be very gregarious when he wanted to. But he had a quirky side to him. I I, I remember uh, I remember two two stories early on. They picked me up at my house to take me to the airport with them. I traveled to the airport with them to fly to uh, Miami because we shot the movie in Miami because the uh, the carnivals all had their hiatuses in, in winter hiatus when it was too cold to travel around the country in Miami. So in you know Dade County. 
So uh, that's what we just, we were going to shoot it. Uh, but uh, he was a big fan of, of Billy Freak, and he was supposed to be his protege. And back in those days, you know, we had VCRs. They didn't have Blu-ray players or, you know, DVD players at that time. You had a Betamax. So he used to carry with him whenever he did a movie. He used to, he used to carry with him. V Toby had VCRs with him waiting for him. And he would watch The Exorcist every single day. Because he was like learning from that movie, like just perfecting his craft. Learn, he absolutely loved loved that movie. So I remember we get to the airport, and uh, all of a sudden he goes, "I forgot my uh, one of my VCRs. I, I let me call up my the, the housekeeper." Calls up the housekeeper on on a, on a house phone. We're in the airport waiting for the plane, and he says. Uh, he says, "So where's the VCR? Did we pack it? Oh, we did. Oh, it's in the garage. Oh, you don't have the keys." And where people are like listening, he's like yelling. He's like, you know, he's outside of the phone booth, like yelling. And he says, well, get a fucking chainsaw and cut the door down. And people are like, oh, what the chainsaw, cut the door down. What, what that was? Anyway, so that was one thing. Second thing was we, we land in, in Miami and uh, there's a limo waiting for us. Because again, this is all, you know, this is Hollywood. This is like a really, this is a really big deal. And uh, there's a limo waiting for us. And there's this little, I guess, frail girl driver wearing the black cap and everything. And she's got a little sign up and she's pronouncing Toby's name wrong. The sound is like, uh, this sign is upside down and she's going, Toby Booper, Toby Booper, Toby. He goes, it's Hooper. My name is Hooper. He goes, oh, I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry, sir. Okay, let me take your bags. Are you sure you can manage it? We, they load us into the limousine, and we're going to drive now to the studios. They filmed it at the uh, Ivan Tour Studios, where they filmed Flipper. Uh, it was a really nice studio lot that had that huge, you know, huge um, uh, complex where you could build the funhouse sets and everything, and you could actually hold a carnival there, which is what they did. But uh, so we're, we're, in, we're in the limo, we're driving, and, uh, and Toby is all of a sudden saying to me, I, I can't believe this driver. What is this? Toby Booper, and she has to sign. And she hears this. And she says to him, listen, I didn't mean any whatever. And he goes, okay, don't worry about it. And then Toby goes back to it again. This Toby Booper, Toby Booper. All of a sudden, she, she went nuts. And she says, I'm not putting up with your bullshit get out of my limo and she pulled over to the side of the road and she dumped us out on a road we were like on a bridge and with our suitcases we had to walk pulling our suitcases to a place where there because we didn't have cell phones to make a phone call to basically get them to pick us up with another limo so that i mean you know again he, he was very nice he was very you know hospitable you know we, we went out to dinner a few times of course he let me pay which i never understood and he's he owed me another dinner which i never ever got but uh you know uh interesting at the dinner he had he had gotten to know uh stephen king and stephen king and him had a discussion about the movie alien what did he think about the movie alien and and uh Stephen King said to Toby Hooper, I'll never forget this, it's a movie about a spacecraft, you know, on board being attacked by a giant lobster. <laughs> Which to me is like, if you really wanted to slice it down to what it actually is, it's a 50s horror movie where yeah. there's a lobster. That sounds like a Roger Corman version of that concept. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, wow. but, uh, yeah, he 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 loved the material. I I was there for six weeks of pre-production, and um, I'm sorry, six days of pre-production. Oh, okay. Because it was a That's short different. budget movie. Yeah. I worked very closely with Toby. We came up with some other stuff. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Kevin Conway, who played the the, the, the the Barkers and played the father, said, "I want one more scene with the kid." And I came up with a scene where it was going to be like a confession booth where he convinces the kid. It's a great scene. I mean, by the way, writers always love their own stuff. This is what one of the problems is. Yeah. But I'm very proud of that scene, you know, where, and I remember, you know, I had a call in on a phone, you know, from the hotel room because they were getting ready to, they were getting, they needed it as soon as possible, even though I had a laptop. Um, 
I said that it's like a confession scene where he convinces he convinces Gunther that he has to do this one more bad thing, which is to kill the kids. You know, it's a very sympathetic kind of character. But then he then he says to him two things. One, I did a quote from uh, from Gone with the Wind where, where before that he says to him, just do this one thing, do this one bad thing. And afterwards, you know, I'll take you fishing or anything you like which to me was crazy because you think of the monster actually going fishing and catching a salmon, you know, and then eating it, <laughs> eating it raw because it's a monster. And then he says to him, which is very moving, and as God is my witness, I don't hate the sound of your voice because prior to that in the scene, which, you know, I wrote, he says to him, I can't stand, don't ever call me that again. And he slaps the kid across the face. Uh, and, you know, and that was the scene. What Toby came up with, and he was very good at this, he was very good at adding a spin on something that was unexpected. So he's the one who came up with the idea of it, that he tells the monster to beat himself up. Hit yourself, boy, hit yourself, boy. If he don't do it, I'm going to do it. That's that, like, redneck Texas Chainsaw Massacre kind yeah. of... Uh, it almost feels religious. It almost feels like a... like a. It uh, is? Yeah, yeah, like like a self-flagellation. I, I, also, I wrote it as a confession scene where it, it's a, it looks like a confessions booth. I mean, this was the thing about the cinematographer and, and, and you know, the set designer. Mm -hmm. I wrote it as it's almost like a religious confession booth. And then that thing is the self, you know, flagellation, you know, that, that uh, hit yourself, boy, hit yourself, boy. And then you do the reveal. Um, but he, he, you know, he was, he was very respectful, very, very... Uh, you know, we be, we we became friends, and you know, a bit of a confidant. And uh, I do remember uh, after Funhouse was over, and you know, we we still stayed in touch for a couple of years. But like a, maybe a, a, after the first year, I get a call from him at ten o'clock at night saying, uh, "Warner Brothers wants to meet with me tomorrow. I'm meeting with John Peters, who ran, you know, was one of the big producers, Peter Goober, and uh, Peter uh, John Peters and." Peter Goober, I guess. Uh, and uh, they said, I'm up for this, this project. It's a book that's called In a Wild Sanctuary by a guy, an author by the name of Harrison. He says, Larry, could you do me a favor? Because I don't have time. Could you read the book? Go to the meeting with me, okay? Get me through this pitch meeting. Help me pitch the thing. Put me in good light. And if we have the deal, you'll, you'll, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll write the movie. So I, I, I got the messenger over the book. I read this book. It was a very amazing book. It was about, uh, it was about uh, in, in, in college, a bunch of college students make a suicide pact, pact. And, you know, where if something happens, they will kill themselves. And then one by one, they start to die. You know, where it's like suicides. And then you find out it's a surprise ending uh, that one of the guys is, is like a serial killer and he's basically, he, he is a sociopath who tricked the guys into doing this. And I'm surprised the movie never got made. Anyway, so we went to the meeting and I'm pitching the story, I'm, I'm, you know, and I'm doing my, my pitch, which I, again, I sort of like perfected the technique beginning, middle and end and you know exactly when to stop and to listen to what they have to say and go, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I did that. It made him look very good. Every time they asked him a question, I said, well, Toby, uh, so what do, you, what do you think about this? How would we actually? He said, well, that's a really good question. Let me think about that, and I'll get back to you tomorrow. You know, it was like, it was like a stalling thing. We, we never made the deal, but we, we worked pretty well as, as, as a team. He took me to the set of, uh, invited me on the set of Poltergeist, which was a joy. And the set of poltergeist was so, what you know the fans continue to debate did toby hooper direct that movie or did spielberg direct that movie what did you see okay what i saw is a couple of things toby because of the work that he did on funhouse and because of the work that he did on uh, salem's lot uh, had a very good eye and knew when stuff looked good. He was blown away by the fact that he was going to be able to do anamorphic on uh, on the Funhouse. You know, this was this is like the same way Dario Argento. You know what, what he does with colors. You know, uh, so he was absolutely blown away by that fact. So when he sees what something beautiful is and beautiful tracking shots, he's great. He has a very good eye for that. Okay. But Toby kind of needs a ally 
who is a producer on the film, who's a really good ally. Salem's Lot is a beautiful film, but he had a very strong producer on that movie. That was Richard Kobritz, who was a uh, who was an executive at Warner Brothers, uh, and actually got to produce a few movies. So he was he was very much under the control of a very good producer. Okay. Spielberg is a very good producer. So the look of Poltergeist doesn't surprise me because we had a very kind of like similar look in Funhouse. And there was a very similar look in terms of the quality of the shots and the tracking shots, et cetera, that, that make it look antithetical to Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which has only, to my knowledge, is like only one beautifully lyrical shot in that. And, and that's when the camera goes under the swing in the beginning of the movie. Uh, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful shot. The camera go, moves under the swing in Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So, you know, uh, anyway, uh, but in terms of story and getting shots, I mean, I've heard that I've heard that, you know, Spielberg was a very powerful producer. By the way, there are Hollywood movies where you've got really strong producers who have really good directors. And, you know, the producer is he's not an executive producer. He's actually doing his thing. So I think I think it's a was a pretty good, you know, corroboration in terms of minds. And, you know, I, I've, I, there are things you can find on the Internet that explain that there was one instance where they were doing a scene and they were both chiming in at the same time. And the actress basically said, uh, I can only have one director. And I think that sort of like changed it. And, and Spielberg like like backed away from being so hands on. Uh, and then he, Spielberg had to do an apology in Variety, I think, or in The Reporter, because uh, they, they were going to, you know, there was a problem. Toby was Director's Guild, and the Guild didn't want to have a producer coming in and saying he directed it. So I believe, you know, th th there is a, a Variety uh, apology from Spielberg saying that it was a pleasure working with Toby Hooper. He directed the film. I didn't direct the film. But there are Spielberg touches in that movie. Just like, again, I, in, in the fun house, there, there, there's a, uh, you know, I got my touches in there, but there's a Toby Hooper touch. I, in, in the scene where, where Buzz gets killed, uh, before Buzz gets killed, I'm sorry, where the, he wrestles with, with a, they, he wrestles with a gun with, 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 the, with the Barker. And I had it be, you know, so, you know, uh, Buzz gets up. The guy's really tough and really strong as he's fighting and pummeling, you know, Buzz. Buzz gets up. And he grabs the guy and shoves him into a sword and the sword goes through him. Well, Toby says, this is great, but you know what I think we could do actually? What about if when he's pulling him towards him, it looks like he's screwing him. He's literally, he's built, uh, 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 and it's great. It's a, it's, it's, it's a great scene. And that's a, you know, that's a Toby Hooper touch. So I don't know. I, I, you know, I, I also heard about Poltergeist that it was a very collaborative effort because, across the board in terms of story and everything else, because it's interesting in Hollywood, when a movie is successful, everybody takes credit for it. I used to do pitch meetings at people who worked on Poltergeist and they go, oh, I came up with that. I came up with that. You know, what we did, we sat around, we had a meeting, and everybody was in a room and we were asking, you know, Spielberg was asking questions like, what scares you? What scares you? And people were coming up with, well, I was afraid of clowns. So people came up and said, I, I had a tree outside my door. So, but everybody kind of like takes credit for it. Yeah. But it's a great, it's a, it, it's a great movie. And uh, it's, re it's really good filmmaking. Uh, and uh, in answer to your question, a lot of Toby's other films are, they've got great scenes in them, but they're not as well structured. It's really interesting. I, I think that it's a little bit of a, there, Toby had certain expectations. He was pronounced a wunderkind when he did Texas Chainsaw Massacre. He comes to Hollywood. Uh, he's going to be a protege of Billy Freakin. It's going to be great. It's going to be amazing. And then he kind of like stalls. And the people in Hollywood don't quite understand who he is and what he can do. So he does a series of, he, he does a series of movies that are are not successful. He, he, the two pictures that he's, he's kicked off of. He's supposed to do Venom and he's supposed to do The Dark. 
and he's kicked off those pictures for whatever reason. And then, and then his big comeback is uh, when, he, when, when he does uh, Salem's Lot. And again, very powerful producer on that movie. And I go to this, I go to this, the Hollywood screening of it, the Warner Brothers screening of it. It's really fun. They, they had box lunches that they give you, and you know, you, you know, and you're sitting, you're watching the movie on a big screen. And then it's over, and I have people coming over to Toby, and they go, Oh, Toby, you did it again, you did it again, way to go, way to go. And I'm horrified because I'm thinking to myself, they're making like it's like you did Texas Chainsaw and you did this. No, the guy suffered. He got had he had some really bad movies that he you know that he got kicked off of. You know, uh, uh, Eaten Alive is interesting. It's got some moments in it. He he's working for uh, a low budget company doing low budget movies, and then all of a sudden he's elevated because he does this movie. And to me, it's because I'm freelance also, and I know what it's like, the feast or famine part of it. So it's, it's, so I don't think, I mean, if you look at the stages that he went through, he did Funhouse, and then he did Poltergeist. And then when that was over, for whatever reason, it's like he never did a, to my knowledge, a big budget beautifully looking, well-structured film again. I don't think he ever really understood what Hollywood was all about or how he was going to be treated. Uh, and I don't think they knew what to do with him. So there's a part of me that's kind of like very sad about that. And then everyone, oh, it was great. He did this, he did fantastic. And other. He, it's very frustrating for creative people not to have an outlet. And uh, to me, ultimately, I think it was, he had... He had expectations which were not met, and I don't think he ever understood the medium that he was working for when he was doing studio pictures, even though they were low-budget studio pictures. And, you know, the last movie that he did was, was Foreign Money, you know, it was uh, Gin, which, which is, I don't know if you've seen it or whatever, and uh, it's, it's not good. It, it's, it's almost like a throwback to his other f films that didn't, that didn't work. But he, he had genius qualities in him, and some of his stuff is amazing, and, uh, you know, left a pretty interesting legacy. By the way, he dropped out of Funhouse for a period of, like, six days. And I think it was maybe because there was other stuff going on with, maybe with E.T. or something. And believe it or not, they brought in Joe Dante. And I had, I had two meetings on the Funhouse with Joe Dante. Uh, he was a pleasure. He was a really, a really nice guy. And, you know, and he read the script and liked the script. And actually, believe it or not, he's the one who came up with the idea of saying, well, you know, Joey's in the movie. And because uh, I had scenes in the beginning of the movie where, where J Joey is caught under the covers reading uh, Hansel and Gretel with a picture of the witch, which looks exactly like the, the, uh, the bag lady who's saying, God is watching you, God is watching you. So it was like a really, and, and his mother comes, he's reading under the covers and his mother pulls the covers away and she, she's got a flashlight and she raises her hand to like, she's going she's gonna to smack the hell out of him. So in a sense, he's really running away. He's running away from the house that night to, you know, to, you know, and he wants to go to the carnival, but there was a motivation for him wanting to get out of there and why he's tortured and scared on the way, you know, you know with, with everything creepy can happen to him. Uh, that was, that was cut out of, the, there was a lot of stuff that was cut out of the film, uh, which, which is, which is very frustrating. Uh, I, the monster was not supposed to die at the end of the movie. He was supposed to resurrect because he was not a human being. He was supposed to be a supernatural character, which I went through all the trouble to get you to believe that he could be a supernatural, you know, character. And I actually had in the last shot of that film when you have the, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the fat lady comes comes back to life. You know, the, the animatronic comes out. The reason why she comes back to life isn't that Beth Elizabeth Berridge is out of her mind at that point. It's because inside the bottom of the fun house, when you when you, you go back to the monster, you hear a creaking and the chain snaps and it frees him and he comes back to life. This was supposed to be like Halloween where he continued to come back and he would be a supernatural character. They didn't they didn't shoot it. Did you have franchise potential? Were you thinking 
this will be a series, you know? Always. <laughs> I, 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 the, the, the point was he wasn't supposed to die. I had, listen, I had just seen, I had seen the movie Halloween. Right. And I am convinced to this day, and, you know, I've, I, I, I'm, just, I'm, I'm holding by it. It's a great, it's a great movie. It's a phenomenal movie. But they were doing a certain amount of flying by the seat of their pants. I do not believe, because it's false, it doesn't, it doesn't work. I do not believe they had in mind that it was a supernatural character. Because it isn't a supernatural character. It's a kid who, who sees his, his sister in bed with a guy and kills them both and winds up in a madhouse. And there's nothing about that that isn't about a serial killer. There's nothing supernatural about that. But then as they were shooting it, well, let's make it creepier. We'll have him hiding. He seems to be there behind the bush, but there's nobody behind the bush. So we'll do that. We'll do that. Great, great. And now we get to the end of the movie where he gets blown off the balcony by Donald Pleasance. And, you know, the body is down there. And then the body's not down there. You see a you see twisted, you know, uh, 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 twigs. And I'm saying, so that's what, oh my gosh, well, now we'll make it supernatural and we'll, you know, and we'll bring him back. Well, in the fun house, again, he wasn't, when he was under the Frankenstein mask, you couldn't tell who he was and he seemed to be hulking, by the way, very funny. So again, in my six days of pre-production, I'm with them and they're trying to figure out what mask they want to use because they can use the whole Funhouse gallery, including, you know, the, 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 the mask that they use, the Don Post, whatever it is. And they, and they, uh, they say, well, how about this mask? And I'm sitting in front of the, the you know, the, 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 the guy who's doing the dress, you know, the, 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 you know, the makeup and the dressing guy. And I'm saying to him, you can't use a normal size mask. You gotta, it's gotta be a big mask because he's got a big head. How do you have a normal, how did the head come out from underneath that? They, and all of a sudden, it's like the producer, oh, yeah, you're right, you're right. Well, what about if we get this one and we cut the back of it and we expand it, we make it bigger? Yes. Otherwise, it would have been, a, it, 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 it wouldn't have worked, you know? So, uh, yeah, I want, I, he was supposed, they even had a thing where they had glowing eyes. They had light bulbs that they put in the eyes. So that could, as a practical, you could see that this thing had had real crazy eyes as opposed to, you know, contact lenses or, or whatever they did in the mask itself, where they cut out a hole so you can see through the pupil. Uh, no, he, he was supposed to be a troll. Like, like, a, like a, he, could, he could sniff. He could absolutely sniff her out when she was like running. And the other thing that was the biggest disappointment of all in the movie was I had a, a like a five minute chase scene similar to Suspiria. Obviously, I'm a big fan of Suspiria. I, I, it's, it's, it's a great movie. It, visually, it's, it's the most beautiful movie ever made. It, it, a horror movie ever made visually. It's just, it's just gorgeous. And... So I had a chase scene that was, you know, Buzz gets killed, the monster, you know, comes down, his father is dead, and he wants Amy. And he doesn't, he wants Amy in an amorous way. He wants to, he imprints on Amy. He wants Amy to be his new caregiver. It's like it's his mate, which is why in the beginning of the movie, you have a kind of thing with the bride of Frankenstein. And then, which is the reason why when you have Madame Zena, who's a supernatural part of the movie, where she says a tall, dark stranger will enter your life and change your life. Well, she's talking about the monster. This chick is going to be, is going to wind up, is going to wind up like the bride of Frankenstein. She's going to be the bride of the monster who is in the funhouse. So they, you know, anyway, they didn't do the chase. They didn't do the chase scene. They, all they did, they, they had uh, Verna Fields, who was, the, was the, uh, the main editor who edited Jaws, and they made her a vice president at Universal. She came in and worked on the editing of the footage. And she's the one who came up with the idea that, well, you know, we don't, we don't really have a chase scene, but we can give an illusion of a chase scene by having her, you know, having Amy look around like she's really scared and moving a little bit and then have all these things happening around her, like they're taunting her. All the, the mechanical creatures are taunting her. And, uh, and 
So they did a really good job on it. But the other part of this was that the culmination of that chase scene was, and by the way, she's a loose, by the time you get to the end of that chase scene, she's so hysterical, she's hallucinating. You know, she's just, it's just horrible, like just amazing being taunted by these figures. I had her running head on into one of the figures and it falls down and it cracks open and you realize under the face is a body which would have told you that a lot of the or a lot of the things in the funhouse were corpses of you know that that they had killed that gunther had killed and his father had cleaned up the mess for and that would have put it to a whole nother level and you know in in terms of a of a sequel you you would have had them you know they get a you know the father's dead but some, some he's got this big appetite for eating people so from, he murders he murders because he's misunderstood you know whatever and uh but yeah so you were talking about the setup for a sequel yeah well it, in in hollywood right now everything old is new again is there life for the fun house in 2023 or beyond oh yeah yeah so uh originally five or six years ago maybe it's seven years ago now eli roth wanted to remake it in 3d and if you go on bloody disgusting you know they 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 had an interview with him where he says he loves the fun house loves the first half of the fun house great characters but then when they're caught it, it's too tame they they don't you know they 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 should have get their eyeball punctured yeah, yeah. Or they like should that. torture them they should do this they should do that okay so then he went from saying i'm going to direct it to i'm going to uh I'm just going to produce it with Strike. I think with Strike Entertainment. I'm I'm not sure. Anyway, it's still. If you look on IMDb, the 3D movie is still in. Now, technically speaking, they can't make the movie because I recaptured the rights to the fun. I own the rights to the Fun House. I got the rights back like two years ago, and uh, uh, and I'm you know I'm working on making a, making a remake sequel, uh, and then the Tarantino book came out like three or four months ago and it wow I mean it all of a sudden he devotes one full chapter to the fun house talks about it like you know how much of an effect it had on him talks about all its virtues all its vices and he celebrates me in this he have you talked have you reached out to him or has no I him? I'm I my the agent that I'm using on the fun house he got the rights back to me I have to be very careful with what I'm doing. I wanted to thank him because, again, he mentions me three times. He says the biggest surprise of all in the movie was my script, which to me was such a nice thing to be validated by Tarantino. So I'm no longer like an age, a, a, a legend in my own mind. I'm a legend <laughs> in Tarantino's mind as well. So, yeah. But yeah, no, uh, he, he doesn't. My agent is telling me that he doesn't, he won't do remakes or sequels, but I'm working on something now, which is very crazy. It's too soon to talk about it. And if it happens, I'll, I'll let you know about it. Okay. And it's just, it's an interesting process that, that what, what's changed in Hollywood is None of the streaming services want to do any work. So if no, they don't want to do any work. They want it's everything true. handed to them. They want a deal in place. You want the you bring exception, eight episodes already finished and sell it to us and we'll Yeah, yeah. We'll but, put it but, up and we won't tell you how it performs either. But, but but even but 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 even you know uh, if you look at like a movie like Bullet Train, what a cast. Unbe- un- 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 unbelievable. Uh I guess they bought it as is or something that, you know, I, 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 but it's other than that, or other than a movie like, uh, remember Bright, that was their most, ex- uh, Pride of Bullet Train, that was their most expensive effort that they did, Bright with Will Smith. That, that's a cookie, that's a, it's a paint by number, throw every trope from every sci-fi fantasy and horror movie that you can imagine into that but what concerns me and you can speak to this is that we are now a couple of generations into that or at least 15 years into that and the there's an audience that's been raised on that and they have no expectations beyond just give me what i want give me a spectacle i'll eat my popcorn i don't have to think about it again that concerns me but i will bet you i will bet you that when people are doing it right it finds the audience because you know it, it it finds the audience because it's real and it it 
it touches a nerve. I, I believe all those fairy tales and all those cautionary tales going back to, you know, Grimm's fairy tales, they all work. I believe that all the Twilight Zones work. Uh, M. Night Shyamalan has made an entire career of doing Twilight Zones. And sometimes he hit, a lot of times he hits, sometimes he doesn't hit, but uh, that's what he's doing. So when when it were and Jordan Peele is doing that absolutely 100 percent he knows what he's doing in terms of that you know even even the I, I get very emotional at the ending of nope nope is a movie that you know you, you got to watch it a few times and you got to really relish it and you know uh you got to really savor it and, and and you know the problem is I was just told by someone that when it comes to Netflix when they make decisions about which films they're going to pick up, if they if 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 their their viewers have a two and a half minute ex- uh, attention span, if you if you and unless there's some compelling reason, you know, uh, uh, like Brad Pitt or, or somebody in a movie, if you haven't gotten them in the first two and a half minutes, you 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 don't have them. Uh, I'm trying to sell a project that I did with a, a Colombian filmmaker. Uh, I became very close friends with him. It's a movie called Tales from Las Cruces. Maybe you've, I, I put some stuff out on it on, on the internet. But we finally, I think we, 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 we were able to sell it. It'll be up on, on streaming. But one of the points is that you have to learn that when you're re-editing a film, you got to, if they tune out in two and a half minutes, you're finished. Uh, and it's a very short attention span. Only somebody like Tarantino can do something where he can have really long dialogue going on, you know, f- and, and for an immense period of time, and it, and it works. I mean, listen, Paddy Chayefsky is w- brilliant. I mean, he, he, he had three phases in his life. He did social, kind of like social justice of the common man. He did Marty. And then he entered his phase of, of rebelling against society where he did the hospital and he did network. Greatest and then he time. finished it. He finished off his career by doing a horror movie. He did Altered States, which, which you know, Ken Russell got his hands on and changed it into something else. But at the heart, uh, it's a great. I think it's a great movie. At the heart of it, uh, even though he wanted to take his name off it, but he put his name on it. His his real name, uh, Sidney Aaron, on it. Uh, but even a movie like that, it hits home because it it. It ultimately it says something about overreach and how important love is, and I think people fall for that. They 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 still love that, but you but you couldn't do anything like that, you know. Tarantino could do it because you're expecting long speeches from Tarantino. Yeah, but he's and, winded down. He's working on his last movie, so he says. I think he wants to go to TV, maybe. But I think that we're I think we're sitting on the cusp of a new. What I think we're and something new is coming. I think that what we're we've been living through this moment in time where all these companies are super serving us with I say super serving us with mediocrity. I actually just made a video about it a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the they're giving us tons and tons of just it's just popcorn stuff and there's not a lot of substance to it. I think people are getting hungry for better entertainment for better stories for things they can relate to and to to bring us full circle where the conversation started something with some sort of a moral center i think the reason people like friday the 13th is because it is essentially a moral play you know scream these movies have something to say about who we are morality like you know there's rules there's rules to this stuff and 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 you can like with scream you can you you can play with the rules because you're playing with horror fans who now know the rules but you can still flip it around and make it scary. The, 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 worst, the worst horror movies in the world are when they try to make them funny and they don't know how to do it. Or they try to make them satirical and they don't know how to do it. My, my, one of my favorite movies of all time is, is uh, Dan O'Bannon's Return of the Living Dead. That movie is excruciatingly scary and excruciatingly funny. And Dan O'Bannon knew how to do this because Dan O'Bannon had a real love of horror. So, but he knows how to do it. When, when you take it in the hands of someone else who doesn't know how to do it, it's just awful. I mean, it, 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 it's horrendous. 
I, I had a project I once did. I, I don't, it's off on a tangent, but it was called Fate Totally Worse Than Death. To make a real long story short, uh, it was a book by, by Paul Fleischer, Fleischman. Um, hysterically funny and scary. It was, it was like kids at a high school who, who, who uh, are very mean to uh, the student and they wind up killing her by accident. And then an exchange student from Sweden comes, comes back to the school the following year and they're convinced it's, it's her ghost. Has all the scary tropes in it, is hysterically funny. And they tried to make it into a movie. I got in touch with the, the production company that had the movie and I, 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 because I wanted to get the book to work on, you know, to, uh, to develop my own, you know, movie on it. They showed me the script that they had developed on it. And I said to them, you ruined the story. It doesn't know how to do the horror tropes in it. It's, it's supposed to be scary. The book is scary. It's, it works. Uh, they said, okay, fine. So we'll hire you to do the rewrite. Go do the rewrite. I did the rewrite as, as faithful to the, you know, to the source material as possible. Made it nice and scary again in the right places with the right, you know, horror trope expectations that the audience has. And then, uh, they hire a director off that script and uh he all of a sudden wants to bring another writer and they always bring writers and it's amazing directors like to bring their own writers in gets rid of the horror tropes puts the comedy back into it and wrecks it and the movie gets released under a different title and it's just awful i'm, I'm just saying it, it's people who don't understand horror movies and you can have a five minute conversation with someone, ask them one question, like a couple of litmus questions about whether they think of this movie or that movie. If they don't get it, don't hire the person because they don't, they don't get it. Man, you've given us a lot to think about in this episode. You shared a lot of stories and uh, some, some tantalizing teases for the future. There's so many, there's so much more we could talk about, but this was just a really great conversation about the fun house, about Toby Hooper, about horror and about why some of this stuff works and maybe some of it doesn't. So uh, this was great. Where can people tell people where they can go to find you and keep in touch with everything you've got going on? Okay. On, uh, on Instagram, it's, it's at, it's at Larry Block screenwriter. I had to do that because there's two other Lowry blocks or Lawrence blocks always getting mixed up. Uh, literally always. So I, I had to do that. I know. It I sounds... love all your crime fiction books that you've written over the years. Mr. Yeah, Edward. it's not. Yeah. It's, you know, I had, to, I had to contact him, his people, and basically say to them, because they're, they're ta he's taking credit for certain things he's mentioned. And I, and I said to him, could, could you please put a link to me because they make a mistake? And they actually addressed it, which was very nice. That's good. And so they, they do send people over to me. Uh, on IMDb, I'm uh, Lawrence J. Block, a.k.a. Larry Block. If it, the easiest way to get me is just put in Larry Block the Funhouse and a bunch of stuff comes up on, on YouTube. On YouTube, it's... it's I think it's at Larry Block. We just do just do Larry Block and uh, uh, the Fun House. Yeah. Well, Larry Block and any of the you know just do Larry Block and the Fun House. Yeah, I'll link to it all in the description. If you give me the links, that'll be that'll yeah. be great. This was fun. Um, great. Well, there you have it. That was such an interesting conversation to me because I'm mean, gonna give you like peel the curtain back and give you a peek behind the scenes. So Larry uh, knew Stan Lee. He worked on some Marvel projects and we were going to talk about that in this interview. And I realized how like this Funhouse information is so revelatory, so important, so um, frankly just fascinating. I mean, the way that Larry thinks about horror, the way that he's able to break down why it works, the elements of it that you know he's thinking about on these whole other levels. And that's so rare in my experience that I actually get to talk to somebody like that. So there was a fun house all the way. So I want to have Larry back to talk about some other things, to talk about Marvel work, to talk about Stan Lee and just general stories from uh, his time working in Hollywood. And then he's got things coming up, right? So there's things that we can talk about in the future as well. But I think this was a real treat for anybody that loves this stuff like I do. And I know you do because you're here and you made it this far into the episode. So you're hearing this, which means you really do love this stuff. Um, Please remember to rate, review, subscribe. If you're on YouTube, give us the thumbs up. Wherever you're uh, listening to this or consuming this, please leave a comment or a review so that you're engaging with us. These are the things that help um, podcasts grow 
at this point in the game with, you know, 117 billion podcasts uh, and, and like 365 new podcasts born every single day. That's the best thing that you can do is to just engage, to go not just to download it. That's great. But to go like, oh, I like this or I want to leave a review for this. That helps other people to find this stuff because it's these algorithms, these mysterious machine algorithms that promote content that gets engaged with. Uh, It's the only way to do it. So thank you guys. Stay tuned. Another exciting conversation coming very, very soon. Uh, I appreciate you. Take care. Until next time, I will catch you later.